Hi, this is Mel Berkowitz for the Mel Berkowitz Present Show. My guest for this show is Rabbi Moshe Taub. Thank He's you, Rabbi man. on the Young Israel of Holliswood, formerly known as Holliswood Jewish, Jewish Center, Center correct. which I attended even 45 years ago. Oh, is that so? So uh, let's start with your background and w how you became the rabbi and everything. Sure. Well, I'm new to New York. I was born here, just to get really to the background. Moved to Toronto, and that's where I was raised from the age of four onward. Uh, I served as a rabbi. My first position was in Buffalo, New York. I served there for 12 years, as well as ran the BVK, the Buffalo Bada Kashras, a kosher council that has now grown, and we serve really uh, the entire world, or more of a boutique kosher certification. And about two years ago, two and a half years ago, uh, I moved to Queens, and I took over this wonderful community and synagogue. How does Queens compare to Toronto? Because I've been to Toronto Film Festival twice. Ah, I see. Toronto's a great city. Great country. Um, very different than Queens. A lot less traffic, more areas to park, and more polite. But we love Queens, and we love Toronto. Well, at the film festival one year, I got this T-shirt from an Israeli group or Orthodox group. It had a picture of a pistol and it said, don't mess with the Mossad. <laughs> and the people at the film festival raised their hands in support of that t-shirt. You know, one thing that, that's a great story. One item of commonality between Toronto and Queens. Uh, in Toronto, it's a very large Jewish community. I would say about a quarter of a million maybe even getting close to half a million. Toronto is an ever-growing city, the largest city in Canada by, by far. Uh, and because of that, the kashrut, kosher certification, is all over the place. And that has led to a domino effect where almost all denominations of Judaism in Toronto, many of certainly the Orthodox synagogues, but the temples, Reform and Conservative, they all observe uh, a certain level of kashrut buying from the same stores, which brings a certain level of um, commonality between the people. And I see that in Queens, too. Uh, some of the conservative and reform rabbis who are, I'm friendly with, I see in the kosher restaurants here. It's a, it's a big town, Queens, but the Jewish community is very much together. Oh, yes. Well, you, know, you also don't leave out Great Neck in that area. Sure. Well, give me time. It's only give been two years. Only two years. So... Um, how, what's your impression of this place? Because his place been here 50 years or more. Uh, Queens is an unbelievable Jewish community. It's uh, an old Jewish community. It may surprise some of your viewers that Buffalo is also a very old Jewish community. We'll get back to Queens in a moment. Um, Buffalo used to be one of the larger cities in the United States. Used to be. Yes. Uh, certainly the steel industry in the 70s and 80s destroyed it, but uh, even before that it went down. Uh, it's still a wonderful town, but um, we know that President McKinley was assassinated there. Mm -hmm. The World Fair was, was there at the time. That's why he was there in 1900. But the Jewish community was founded in the early 1800s in Buffalo. Uh, and in fact, I recall when I was a rabbi there, we had uh, a sheet, a photocopy, from an old newspaper called the American Hebrew. The American Hebrew was a broadsheet at the turn of the century for all Jewish communities around the United States. <clears throat> and the reason why we had this was because the first Hasidic Rebbe, the first Hasidic Rebbe in America was in Buffalo, New York. Oh, really? That's correct. And he was buried in Buffalo, New York, and he's still there today. Yeah. He didn't move him to Israel. And there are busloads from Satmer and Williamsburg, really from all over the world, they who come, come to his Ohel because it's a very large um, graveside. They have a tent and a small stone house. People come and pray. Uh, but why I mention this story is, besides the fact that no one would expect that Buffalo had the first Hasidic Rebbe, uh, 
on that broadsheet it was from 1911 when he died. So it was the Buffalo section of the American Hebrew, which is interesting that Buffalo was big enough at the time to have a section in the American Hebrew. But when you read that uh, broadside and you read a little bit about Buffalo in 1911, you learn about what went on in the Jewish world. And what was so fascinating, there was an advertisement on that page. So it said, you know, Rabbi Rabinovich, the first Rebbe in America, he died on Tuesday, whatever date it was. And then the next entry was Robert, I think his name was Altberg, is giving a class on November 3rd, 1911, on 14 Delaware Avenue. And in 1911, November 4th, whatever date it was, 1911, the title was The Early Jews of Buffalo, New York, which is bizarre because he was an early Jew of Buffalo. But I always tell people it's a great lesson because everybody thinks they live in the moment. He thought he was living in the present. We are all members of someone else's past. And we have to bequeath them a great future. So Buffalo had great members of the Jewish community in the early 1900s who recognized this message and who built up community day schools and synagogues and mikvahs. I'm sure many of your viewers know what that is. Um, when I was there, I had the opportunity to- You saw to the mikvah in Baltimore. Sure, sure. Baltimore is one of the oldest religious communities in America, the first rabbi on these shores who had classic European rabbinic ordination. His name was Rabbi Abraham Rice. He arrived about 1840, 1850 to America, and he soon became the rabbi in uh, Baltimore. In fact, in Baltimore, he was named the chief rabbi of the United States of America. Now, it was just a title that the Presidium gave him, but uh, the Baltimore Sun, or one of the Baltimore secular newspapers at the time, also titled him such. In any event, so Buffalo had this great past, and they built up a great community, and I mentioned parenthetically, I had the opportunity to build an Eruv there, um, one of the largest in the country, about 22 miles all around. Uh, but it's a small community. So coming to Queens, which was your original question about this community, uh, I have a unique perspective because I'm coming from Toronto, which is a large community, and then Buffalo, which is a very small community, and then to Queens, which is a very large community with an even greater and richer history. Um, there's uh, untold options of community day schools, high schools, synagogues, maybe too many synagogues. That's it's like the old joke of the island, the ten men and the two shuls. Uh, but it's beautiful. You know what? In Queens, and for your viewers in particular, there's no excuse not to be close to God. You could find the rabbi if you're looking. You could find kosher food if you're looking. You could find a Jewish community center we have here in the synagogue, where I know you from. We have Jaza, which is an unbelievable organization. Uh, great friends and fun and food and trips. So Queens offers really amazing opportunities to Jews of all ages, the elderly and the young. Uh, and it's very special. And its rich history is also very special. And there's also a big Sephardic community. Tremendous, Bukharian. Bukharian well, they're folk. latecomers. They are latecomers. <laughs> they are latecomers. They're from southern Russia. Right. So when, when it was the USSR, they really couldn't travel. Exactly. Um, all the Tans, Uzbekistan, they're all the, the Bukharians. Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan. That's right. But it's a melting pot. Right? So, you know, it's actually interesting, at least in the Orthodox community, who influences who. The Orthodox have a way of dress. The Svardim have a way of dress. And the rabbi, a Sephardi rabbi, has their way of dress. An Orthodox rabbi has his way of dress. And it's interesting, the customs in this melting pot that are being traded back and forth, fascinating. I actually teach in one of the high schools here. Oh. Shevach, it's the local Beis Yaakov. Beis Yaakov is the classic Orthodox women's high school. And about 20% of the, of the girls there are Sephardi. So I teach Jewish law. So when I used to teach Jewish law, I would just teach how I rule my jurisprudence. But now that I have Svardim in the class, not only do I teach Svardi law as well, but on an exam, you're able to answer either the Ashkenazi position of Jewish law or the Svardi position. Of Jewish and they're law. different. They are different. Not always, but in many instances, there are differences. You know, that's well, the beauty of Judaism. I was interviewed for teaching position in 
chemistry at a Syrian synagogue in Brooklyn, Sephardim. But they want to know how would I handle a class of girls who were disruptive. <laughs> they didn't like my answer. What did you say? I said I would stand over them, to those who were talking, and, and give an angry look at them to quiet them down. Nothing wrong with an angry look. Well, they would only make them stronger. Yeah. The Syrians, you know, what's so fascinating about the Sephardim, we all talk about the Holocaust, as we should. The great forgotten part of history, or the unspoken, is the Holocaust of the Sephardi countries. How they were uh, just destroyed, the synagogues burnt, running for their lives. And they came here like the Eastern Europeans, with no money. And they built up tremendous wealth in some instances, and families dedicated to Torah and tzedakah, charity, and synagogue life. Um, and I think it's important, especially in Queens, that in addition to continuing teaching about the Holocaust, to inform the children of why there are so many Svartim here, the great diaspora that they went through, and how they were thrown out of their countries. Yeah, the recent article says, we talk about the Palestinians being exiled. Why don't they talk about the Jews in South a North Africa? Right. You know, when they talk about the right of return, my response is, that's great. Let's do it across the board, though. Let's have all the Syrians get their houses back. There's a member of my synagogue who came from Afghanistan. I think there's one Jew in Afghanistan left. The New York Times had an article a couple of years ago. I'm assuming he's still there. But he was very wealthy. And before they left, they didn't just build a great home for themselves, but they built a synagogue. He said it was the most exquisite, majestic, gorgeous synagogue you've ever seen. And they had to abandon it. And who knows? And so often in these cases, those that drove them out not only took away their land, but they didn't even utilize the buildings that they created. They would decimate the buildings. You know, they could use it. My, they uh, had no sense of culture. No sense. My, uh, my father, about 20, 30 years ago, had the uh, wonderful experience to lead a March of the Living tour. And it was at the time when the Siam Hashas was happening. So the Siam Hashas, for your viewers, the Talmud, of course, is a very large book, very complex. So if you study a folio, if you study it intently, it will take you a few hours to do one folio. If you do one of those every day, in seven and a half years, you'll finish the entire Talmud. So about 100 years ago, they started this program across the world. And it keeps growing and growing and growing. And I do it, we give a class here. So I could go to Mexico City and find people studying the same page of Talmud as me. And then four years ago when we finished it, the last time, uh, what's the stadium where the Giants play? MetLife? Yeah, MetLife. MetLife was completely sold out. 70,000 people, really? Jews, yeah, to make the seal. Toronto had 10,000 and Israel had 30,000. It was, it was ridiculous, ridiculous, unbelievable. Tremendous sanctification of God's name. <clears throat> and I mention this because he happened to have the occasion to be in the ancient yeshiva of Lublin. Lublin, its founder, Meir Shapiro, was the founder of Dafyomi. So he was able to complete the Talmud in the very building, in the very place, in the very city, which had its birth. And what was fascinating was is that that yeshiva was turned into a medical school. And at least they kept the building. But in these Arab countries, they just would destroy them. Yeah, you know, yeah. A medical school, at least, is a prominent, it's respectable. Uh, it would be nice if it would be an historical site, but okay, we'll take a medical school. But so often in the Arab countries, they destroy any remnant. That's ironic, because they talk about Arab civilization 2,000 years ago, 1,000 years ago, and it just went downhill right after that. You know, yeah. the Jews and Arabs have lived together in peace for many centuries. Um, some of our great mathematicians in history, poets, Maimonides certainly quotes in his uh, non-halachic books, books not about Jewish law, quotes from philosophers from Arab lands. Um, it's unfortunate. I think they, what a world it would be if we could unleash the civil potential of the Muslim communities. There is nothing more dangerous than anger. I don't want to 
there are viewers who aren't Jewish who are watching. I'm not trying to be polemical. Mm -hmm. Even if you believe you're right, anger doesn't help, and it's holding their civilization back. And we have over a billion people who, so many of them, uh, don't have education uh, and are unaware of this ever-growing environment that we're living in. And what a different world it would be if we can unleash that potential. Well, even China's having trouble with Muslims. Yeah, listen, it's, uh, I don't know, you know, the, the Bible discusses this, this as an issue. It predicted this as an issue. Um, it's a problem. Well, there's a movie I recommend you to see. I don't know if you've seen it yet. It's called The Gift for Stalin. No, what's that about? It was shown at the Jewish Film Festival. And it deals with the uh, community in Kazakhstan. And uh, after the war, Stalin sent a lot of Jewish orphans down to Kazakhstan. And deals with the, some of them living there and integrating with the people there. And how they lived their lives. So uh, they were having a big celebration for Stalin, who suppressed them. And it ends with the fact that Stalin tested the first atomic bomb in Russia, sure. in Kazakhstan. And they were sending a goat to Stalin as a gift. Huh. So it was a very moving movie. I hadn't realized it. That's fascinating. And what happened to the Jews who got to Siberia to escape the Nazis and then were exiled to Kazakhstan when the war was over. Unbelievable, unbelievable. You know, I, I mentioned the outset that I, I work in the kosher industry. And what reminded me of the kosher industry with that story is there's almost no city in the entire globe that Jews in their diaspora haven't traversed. Whether it's due to war or in the kosher industry, I have to travel as do much larger kosher organizations everywhere. And the Talmud actually says that one of the purposes of exile is to be almost everywhere. And it's, I was talking the other day, uh, I don't, I'm sure your viewers are familiar, but Shanghai, uh, the Mir Yeshiva, which is the largest yeshiva today, about 10,000 students in Jerusalem. So they started in Poland, in the town of Mir. When World War II broke out, they needed to escape. And a significant portion went to Shanghai. Thanks to a Japanese ambassador. That's right. That's right. <coughs> An amazing story, really. And uh, who would have thought that one of the great yeshivos and so much Torah was studied and written in Shanghai? Well, you have to go back to 1900. Jews weren't angry at Russia. They were angry at the Tsar. Hmm. And uh, Felix Warburg helped finance the Russo-Japanese war in favor of Japan. So they were grateful. Even 40 years after in World War II, they were still grateful to the Jews, yeah, which so is why they helped them. That is so interesting. I think maybe, though, the only country we haven't traversed is North Korea. Although the magazine that I work for, Ami Magazine, which is the, the largest uh, Jewish weekly magazine in the world, sold nationwide out a quarter of a million weekly readers. Um, they sent uh, an orthodox reporter just last month to North Korea. And I was reading his account, at least the first part. The second part hasn't been published just yet. And when you go to North Korea, so you have to pass some tests and background checks. He came in through China. So he, he gets on this train that was going to take to North Korea, and you have to stop at this special border patrol area. And uh, you have to go through customs. Now, what does every Orthodox Jewish male have on him that a North Korean has never seen before? It's filling. Yeah, it's filling. So, you know, in the post 9 11 world, these are items that you strap to your body, mm -hmm. gets people a little bit nervous. So the border agent, this North Korean, opens the bag and he takes them out and he says, um, I'm going to go to the back. I'm going to open these up and give it back to you. And he said, you can't open it up. First of all, you won't be able to. You don't have this, the tools. But second of all, these are worth thousands of dollars. And they went to a back room, and I guess they probably Googled what it was. 
And in North Korea, they're not fans of proselytizing for faith or any really religious paraphernalia. People have, are right now sitting in prison due to proselytizing and giving out religious paraphernalia. Mm -hmm. So this was a very dangerous position for this Orthodox fellow to be in. But what ended up happening was the border agent came out and he said, you know, we know about the Jews. Albert Einstein invented the atom bomb, which is what they're trying to build now. And you're smart people. And he showed him a pin, like one you have, but the pin had the two previous leaders of North Korea, the grandfather and the father of mm -hmm. the current leader. And he says, we also keep close to our chest the people that we respect. So we could respect a nation like the Jews, keeping close to their chest on their arm and on their head, like the tefillin, those that they hold dear. And then he let him in with the tefillin. Unbelievable really? story, yeah. What I found so interesting about that story is that the agent clearly, and as the writer wrote, believed that Judaism is a nationality as opposed to a religion, when it's really both. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a nationality, which is true. You're born a Jew, um, but it's also a religion. It has that duality, that dichotomy, that it's both. Well, I don't know how true it is today, but uh, even after World War II, when I went vacationing in Europe, they didn't think of me as American. Thought of you as Jewish. Right, nationality. Well, I, I think, you know, talking about the past, we can move a little bit to the future. One of the great tragedies within the Jewish world is people viewing Jews, viewing Judaism as a nationality and a culture only. You know, the bagel and cream cheese, mm -hmm. the Catskill comedians, um, I remember one of my favorite books on Jewish history. Um, it's called The History of the Jews, written by uh, a wonderful uh, English historian, Catholic. Brilliant book. It's on the New York Times bestseller list for a long time. Anyway, I strongly recommend it. But w it was so fascinating because with my background, even I was able to appreciate it because he would discuss the rabbis that I knew from 500 years ago. The, the writing of the Talmud, the writing of the Mishnah, um, all the great sages and the halachic, the legal battles that existed for thousands of years. But when he got to the 20th century, it all changed. And he, it was all about culture. And I don't know if he recognized that shift from the religiosity mm. to the culture. Not that we shouldn't have culture. We need culture. Mm -hmm. We need culture to survive. And not that we're not a nation. We are a nation. But if we only view ourselves as through the prism of nationhood, then our religiosity will, will be utterly destroyed. Utterly destroyed. And we're seeing that now. Yeah, well, you're seeing a lot of it the marriage. Yeah. Hi. They say that the king of Denmark, I don't know if this is apocryphal, but about what you're saying about intermarriage and the result of uh, cultural Judaism. Uh, he wrote, uh, Hitler wrote him a letter and he said, hey, you know, the world is turning a blind eye. I know you hate the Jews as much as I do. Now's the time. As we say in Yiddish, let's get to it. And the king of Denmark wrote him back and said, you fool. History has shown. You pull a gun or a knife at the Jews, you're only going to make them stronger. But if you give them freedom, they'll destroy themselves. And... Uh, it's, it's very unfortunate we are. If you ask the average non-Jew, American non-Jew, what's the percentage of American Jews? Or what's the percentage of the world that's Jewish? They'll tell you 10, 20 percent when we're a fraction. In America, we're maybe 2 percent. In the world at large, we're not even 1 percent. And that the kids today don't recognize how rare, what a jewel they have, and will destroy it by marrying a leaving aside the Jewish law and all the religiosity, even from a cultural perspective, you can't maintain that through intermarriage. And yet, Jewish philosophy and Jewish thinking permeates the educational system throughout the whole country. Well, Judeo-Christian values. Mm -hmm. I always say that the one thing all three religions agree upon, the three major religions, Christianity, well, in the order of their birth, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. 
What they all agree on is that the Jews received the Torah at Sinai. From that point on, there's a lot of disagreement. But they all agree on the main facet of our faith. Um, they haven't moved away from that. Well, when my cousin's son was Bumas in, in an Orthodox synagogue in Brooklyn, and the rabbi gave a sermon, and he sang that Judaism faces a, a catastrophe in the future. And I was thinking that he was talking about the Palestinians, the Arabs, and uh, he wasn't talking about that. He was talking about assimilation. Well, you know, one of the reasons we believe in global warming is, you'll see the connection in a moment. One of the reasons we believe in global warming is you look at a chart and you see this CO2 level go up and right behind it, the temperature goes up. CO2 down, it goes down. So you see causation, correlation is more than correlation, it's causation. And in other denominations, I hate to say it, some of my best friends are conservative reform rabbis, but they're not practicing, you know, a religion is supposed to be an outside compass. No matter what happens in the world, we'll have a compass to tell you what's right and wrong. But if you look at a graph, as culture changes, they change right with it. And it's so frightening. I don't know what culture will accept that they won't accept. I wonder if they've ever asked themselves that question. What will John Stewart, what does he need to say to make you wash your hands of culture? Um, and, you know, intermarriage, it is so uncouth in 2017 America to say, I want my son to only marry someone from my DNA. Uh, it, it's almost, I'm sure, on a college campus, you'll be called a racist for saying that. And that's intoxicating for some people. For some people, it is, they're so immature in their beliefs. I remember I was watching Katie Kirk. Katie Kirk is a Jew by the way. Really? It's, she I was raised that. Catholic, but her mom was a Jew, a convert. I don't know if it's talked about, but it's even on her Wikipedia page. But, and that means the child that she's going to refer to is also a Jew. She, told, she said on the, this interview that so much change is going on in college campuses, you're not supposed to refer to people by he or she, right? cisgender, however you're supposed to. My daughters are teaching me so much about how to act. I was thinking, that's not how the world works. You're supposed to transmit to her. And it's backwards. Mm -hmm. As the Talmud says, Olam re'iti. I see an upside down, a topsy-turvy world. And it's infected this cancer, reform and conservative Judaism. Um, I, it, it's, it's very unfortunate. And we're losing a lot of Jews. I don't, I don't know that many fourth-generation conservative Jews. They are moving to the right now, to their credit. Uh, they're recognizing to keep a little bit more halacha. Um, yeah, well, that's been the trend. That's been the trend. And, and I say this out of love. Um, I don't want to lose them. But uh, I think 80% of Jewish kids in Jewish day schools in New York City, talking about New York, go to Orthodox day schools. Solomon Schechter's are, my understanding, they're not having an easy time. Some of them may be cruising, but many of them have, have closed down. Mm -hmm. Why would a conservative family who makes middle income salaries spend $10,000 a year for a Jewish education? What has been instilled in them to do that? It's a lot of money. It's a lot of money, especially when you honor culture to such a degree. Well, you know the origin in this temple, it was conservative. Sure. And maybe even communist. <laughs> Are you serious? Well, I don't, there were people who had been in the Communist Party. I don't, but it was a conservative when I started coming here. Right. And the women and the men sat together. And Rabbi Rickman wanted to make it into an Orthodox synagogue, and he had a tough time. And finally they agreed but they fired him. And what happened was the conservative members of the synagogue got angry about the separation of the men and women. They would sit together in, in the conservative. They wouldn't tolerate being separated. Well, you know, I, I don't judge people who feel uncomfortable by separation. 
it's very difficult when you live in a society that thankfully finally accepted <laughs> equality. You could be a law partner and be a female. Why not? And then you come to synagogue and you're sitting behind Mechitza. I understand how that's challenging. Of course, I believe very strongly for it. But what's so fascinating about the history of the shul that you mentioned in the 1960s and 70s, so at that point, conservative Judaism was thought, thought to be the future. Um, after the Holocaust, we've been decimated. So many people turned away from Jewish law and observance. And many Orthodox synagogues started to become conservative. They removed the mechitza, the, the, the separation barrier. Mm -hmm. And there were court battles, hundreds of them across the country. There's a book called The Sanctity of the Synagogue by uh, Baruch Litvin, L-I-T-V-I-N. You can find the book at Amazon, which gives the account of a lot of these battles. But well, what happened is the synagogue would become more and more less observant, or maybe I should say less and less observant, Orthodox observance. And the board would slowly become filled with people who were not Orthodox. And they vote on getting rid of the Mechitza. The problem is any Orthodox synagogue has bylaws. And in those bylaws, it states you must uphold Jewish law. So now they had a problem because the Orthodox members would take them to court and say, no, we have to observe. Jewish law. And they would say, well, the separation is not really Jewish law, because that's the conservative argument. And it went through many courts. The most famous battle was in Michigan. You had a battle in New Orleans, really all over the country. About 80% the Orthodox won, were able to prove to a judge that according to Jewish law, you have to have a mechitza, and 20% were lost. It's a fascinating point in Jewish history. Mm -hmm. And now we see the roles reversed. You see. Uh, conservative synagogues becoming more and more traditional. Um, but it's a frightening future, what's going to be in 50 years. I don't know. I'm going to say something that you may disagree with. I don't know if there will ever be Jerry Seinfelds in 50 years from now. Unobservant cultural Jews will not exist. There was only a brief period that we could create the Steven Spielbergs. Post-World War II, not so observant, but had a grandfather who was observant. Um, but once you get to third, fourth generations, they all marry Gentiles. They try to keep it for the first generation. There's not, the only non-observant cultural Jews that will exist in 50 years will be Orthodox Jews who have sadly left the fold, which is a very small minority. But you will not have cultural non-observant Jews. They will be gone. That's my prediction. What if you're wrong? I hope I'm wrong. I, you know, whether someone is observant or not, a Jewish neshama, a Jewish soul, a Jewish human being is my brother, is my sister, no matter what they do. And I do believe in the divinity of the Torah. And I do believe in the uni unique nature and mission and destiny of the Jewish people. And there's always hope for them to recognize that themselves. And even without recognizing that, they're still holy in my eyes. So I don't want them to disappear. In fact, I say this as a plea to save them. Uh, and they know deep down that... Uh, well, you got the prime example of Trump and his family. There you go. You know, Trump's... I think the, the joke was during the election, the difference between Hillary and Trump. Trump's grandchildren are Jewish. But on that note... It's Hillary's grandmother was Jewish. Right, that's what I've heard that. I've heard that. There's a book called Suddenly Jewish about a lot of people who found out later in life that they were Jewish. But on that theme, I once heard a, a wonderful line, powerful, piercing, a piercing idiom that every American Jew needs to know. You know, there's a fight, a uh, disagreement, maybe I should say, between the Orthodox and other denominations, what makes someone a Jew. We say only if the mother's Jewish. It's a maternal line. And others may make their own argument. But the Talmud is clear. It's maternal. But leaving that aside, what makes you a Jew is not if your grandmother was Jewish, but if your grandchildren will be Jewish. What path are you on? And um, that's the frightening time that we live in. Well, did you see the recent uh, show on ancestry roots? They were 
looking at Bernie Sanders' uh, DNA and Larry David's DNA, mm -hmm. and they found a segment that was exactly the same, meaning that they were cousins. Well, you know, Jews, we are only about 80 to 83 grandparents ago who were by Sinai. That's it. That's the whole distinction, mm -hmm. the whole uh, difference. So Jews are almost all related, but certainly not so distantly. Um, geometric progression has it that if you, you know what geometric progression is, you have two mm -hmm. parents, four grandparents, mm -hmm. eight, 16. Mm -hmm. If you keep going back, there are going to be more grandparents than there were people alive at the time. Right. So how does that work mathematically? Well, it's because we start sharing. You and I, and cameramen, we all start sharing grandparents. Mm -hmm. So we keep going back far enough, we're all going to be related. Yeah, but you're underestimating the power of uh, biochemistry and DNA. No, I, I, I think, listen, uh, Dr. Skorecki, uh, when I grew up in Toronto, Dr. Skorecki was one of the uh, scientists who discovered the Cohen gene. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. Uh, I certainly don't discount it. In fact, Jewish law, like in secular law, has to deal with scientific evidential breakthroughs. Mm -hmm. So by the Twin Towers, for instance, by 9-11, in orthodoxy, as well as by secular law in America, you can't be married to more than one person at a time. So in secular law, after 9-11, how do you prove that your husband died? So there's a process you have to go through, because you don't find all the remains. And Jewish law has very, for thousands of years, this was a big issue through a lot of wars. We've had to deal with the issue. It's called aguna, not being able to remarry, because you don't know if your husband's alive or dead, even though we assume he's dead. So after 9-11, there were people who were killed, and religious, observant, uh, orthodox wives who wanted to get remarried, but there was no evidence. The only evidence we did have of a death was DNA. Mm -hmm. So could DNA be admissible alone without any other um, evidence to prove that someone's dead? And certainly Jewish law takes science and well, biology into account. The other problem is with so much... Uh, in the Hasidic community, they marry each other, the cousins and everything. And there's an increase in the number of genetic defects in the children. Well, there are certainly specific Ashkenazi diseases. I don't know cause and effect. I'm not a doctor. But, you know, you think about the odds. They generally have large families. So if, I have ten cho if someone has 10 children and each one has 10 to 12 children, you have hundreds within a matter of 30, 40, 50 years. Mm -hmm. So the odds alone of, of having an increased number of Down syndrome, et cetera, just simply by the sheer numbers, you're going to have more. You understand what I mean? And then you add to that that Ashkenazis do have specific diseases. Tay-Sachs, one of the frightening ones is familial dysautotomia, which mm -hmm. is, I had a friend in Buffalo, very rare disease, who has a beautiful daughter with this disease. And two of the interesting side effects to variable degrees, depending on who has it, is that the child doesn't feel pain. When I first heard them, I'm like, that's fantastic. You don't feel pain. He said, no, it's a nightmare. Because when you put your hand on a hot stove, you know if you're cold, if you're hot, mm -hmm. if there's a draft, you'll protect yourself from getting the flu. That's right. Just, it's a fascinating concept how important pain is. She also, there's a potential, although I don't think she had this, that you don't taste food. But in any event, but there are very rare genetic hiccups in Ashkenazi community, and who knows why. Um, but, uh, you know, right now in the Orthodox world, before you get married in high school, this may surprise you. In high schools, or some of your viewers, I had to do it, my wife had to do it, everybody gets a blood test. Mm -hmm. And it's called Dor Yesharim. And you're not told if you're a carrier. I mean, you're welcome to go to a doctor and find out. But what this organization does is you get a number. And if you want to get engaged to someone, you each give your number, and they tell you if you're a match or not. Uh, the reason why they don't tell you is that people get paranoid. Because you, 
if I am a carrier for Tay-Sachs, it means nothing unless you're a carrier. That's right. But people are funny. They may not want to marry me because I'm, a, I'm not a carrier. But I'm not a carrier. But if I was, they wouldn't want to marry me. Just to get nervous. So they keep that silent. Well, my niece, we didn't know she was a carrier, mm -hmm. but she didn't marry a Jewish guy. Mm -hmm. So her two sons are not carriers. It, it, yeah, that likelihood is. But it has been found among non-Jews to have Tay-Sachs genes. It's yeah, not impossible. Well, the most famous case is with the Cajuns. What's this case? I thought you knew that. The Cajuns in Louisiana. Uh -huh. They like the Hasidim. They married uh -huh. within. I see. And there was this couple that had a child with Tay-Sachs. And apparently both parents had the Tay-Sachs gene. And they weren't Jewish. So a research scientist went back into history and uncovered an ancestor who was a Jewish fur trader in the 1700s. Yeah. And he wasn't exposed to Jewish women, so he married a Cajun. Yeah. And the Cajuns, I said... So this has nothing to do with what you were saying about marrying in a family. This is just right. a gene. Right. It was a gene. I don't know if there's a, a proof that... But the, yeah. no, what their, their insistence is that they had to have a Jewish ancestor to have the taste sex. Defect. Fascinating. That's fascinating. Fascinating. Um, but in, in the Hasidic world and the non Hasidic Orthodox world, we've become very uh, proficient at weeding out um, mm -hmm. potential matches. Right. Uh, it's horrible, the children who, who suffer from these diseases. Uh, so I, I'm assuming we're, we're going to have to end shortly, yes. but maybe we well, can just talk a little bit, just for another moment, about sure. what we see the future of Queens is like. What is the future? I don't know, right? I would predict the lottery numbers. Uh, I don't know what the future is going to be. But I, I do believe, I truly believe this, that more and more children of people from all denominations who take their religion seriously and take Israel seriously are coming back to the fold. And that's going to be our salvation. The prophet tells us that the children will bring back the parents. And we're seeing that more and more. So we began with parents needing to transmit the children. But sometimes it's the children who need to remind the parents of what they should be transmitting to them. Uh, the Jewish people in Queens, Orthodox and otherwise, are wonderful, giving, amazing people. And you and I both have the same vision and wish that they continue to grow, mm -hmm. to grow in Torah, and to grow in love for each other, and continue to support the state of Israel. And this well, has been an absolute delight. The synagogue is a perfect example. They didn't start out as Orthodox. They you, that's exactly right. They started it's, out conservative. It's, uh, it is the tale of what I believe will be the future of, a, of America. Sadly, and this may be controversial, there have been many halachic Many movements away from halachic Judaism over, over millennia. None of them survived. Well, they didn't have television in those days. <laughs> right. Right. Well, speaking of television, this is an honor to talk to you and to your viewers. And I could go on for hours. Well, it's uh, been great. Yeah, as I mentioned, there was a death in my synagogue yes. this morning. But uh, no, we're cutting it short. That's all right. Thank you so much. Thank you. You've been watching the Mel Berkowitz Show. We just finished talking with uh, Rabbi Moshe Taub. We had a long discussion, a very interesting one, about Judaism and the origins and the future. And in the course, I mentioned the movie, A uh, Gift for Stalin, that was uh, part of the Jewish Film Festival a few years ago. And it dealt with uh, Jews and other people in Kazakhstan. Uh, in the years after World War II, leading up to uh, Stalin testing atomic bomb in Kazakhstan in 1949. And uh, this film was very moving because in, uh, when the Nazis came in to Poland at the beginning of World War II, uh, lucky few Jews were able to escape but Stalin didn't want them in Moscow or other cities. He sent them to Siberia, and the families got separated there. 
Uh, the movie didn't deal with that they got together again, but uh, they were there till the end of the war. And then he had, I wouldn't call it a dilemma, but he had a problem, what to do with Polish Jews who were living in Siberia. He didn't want them there. And uh, he filled up the trains in Siberia, heading south to Kazakhstan. And this movie starts off with a kid on one of the trains going to Kazakhstan. And it starts with that um, episode. And he winds up, winds up with a family in Kazakhstan that will take him in and uh, support him. And that family uh, were Kazakhs. They weren't um, Soviets. They weren't Russians. And they certainly weren't communists. But uh, they took these children in and sheltered them from about 46 till 49. And uh, the kind of corruption that went on with the officials and how they survived. And in 1948 or 49, they were celebrating Stalin's birth. So they came up with an idea, give a gift to Stalin so that he wouldn't uh, take uh, action against them or harm them. And the best thing they could think of was giving a goat to send to Stalin. Uh, a well-bred goat, but it dealt with romance, uh, illicit sex, or marriage, it dealt with marriage, and the chief of police want, was sex with the, the girl who became the wife of the other guy, and eventually uh, they worked it out, so you got to see daily living in Kazakhstan in the post-war generation, the immediate post-war generation. You got a feel of it. And the kind of problems that the communist hierarchy had to deal with the local officials. And eventually, uh, the local official was killed by the husband uh, who married his the local official's mistress. And that was basically this, the bulk of the movie, but uh, they, they were working out the problem of what kind of gift to give to Stalin for his birthday. Uh, he was born 1879, so this was for his 70th birthday. And they came up with the goat. And eventually, uh, the, the children that were exiled to Kazakhstan were reunited with their families or relatives. And the movie ends with the, the boy going back to his family. But as a documentary uh, section, uh, they point out that Stalin used Kazakhstan to test the first atomic bomb that Russia had developed thanks to uh, the spies in England and somewhat in the United States. And the, the film shows you the, the bombing effects in this Kazakhstan. Now we know what Kazakhstan is like because it was rich in mineral resources and it took a long time to economically develop. And it's one of the wealthier countries now, thanks to uh, the mineral ores that exist in that area. And uh, people are doing very well. And of course, you got that second movie by Baron uh, uh, who did a movie about Kazakhstan, a comedy, and the Kazakhs got very insulted 
because it portrayed them as country buffs when actually they were much more sophisticated. So it's a, a good comparison to see these two movies and to see how Kazakhstan is growing in power. And it's a movie worth seeing. It was a sellout performance in the Jewish Film Festival. And I believe it's been aired on TV. So if you see it listed, don't miss it. Uh, in that area, you got other countries similar, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, and the Bukharians who migrated after the breakup of the Soviet Empire who came here, mostly to Queens, and uh, with their uh, retail and with their entrepreneurial skills, they've done very well. The thing is, because of their isolation from Ashkenazi and, and Sephardic Judaism, they are orthodox, but they have unique characteristics in their services. And I uh, had the opportunity to teach Bukharian students both at the Cardozo High School and uh, St. John's University. I wouldn't put them in the rank of intellectuals, more like business people, a business community with religious overtones. And they're beginning to dominate the Queens area. And as the rabbi said, talking about move to a back to orthodoxy, these Bukharians are orthodox, but I don't know if they would feel comfortable with Ashkenazi Jews or Sephardic Jews. They may be a separate line, and as they uh, merge and assimilate, not assimilate so much as adapt to the New York culture, will they be able to maintain their religious identity on the face of such cultural pressure that the Sephardic and the Ashkenazi Jews faced. We will see. But right now, they're the ones behind the big McMansions in Queens, buying up small homes and tearing it down and building them. They dominate Forest Hills. They're dominating Hollis and Flushing. So uh, will they bring the environment of southern Russia to Queens is another story. Or they become much more integrated into uh, New York society. Uh, there was one interesting thing, but it deals with Iranian Jews uh, who uh, felt they didn't want to mingle with non-Iranian Jews, but they were wealthy. And this girl made a movie because the girls in the Iranian Jewish family are supposed to get married early and um, have the marriages arranged. And their husbands view it as a business deal. So the girls who were given more freedom here in Queens and New York don't want that kind of life, and they move out, and they're also moved out to Los Angeles. So she made a movie about her life because she never married. She was in her 30s, and she didn't want to marry an Iranian Jewish man because it was a business deal, not a romantic love. The problem was when she dated American Jews, they felt that she was too money hungry. They didn't want to deal with a woman who was only, con not concerned, but besides romance, they were concerned about making a lot of money and being wealthy, coming from wealthy families. Now, an interesting thing about this young Israel Holliswood, when it was still Holliswood Jewish Center, we had a wealthy Iranian family, 
the the head of the family is a doctor. He's dead now. His son was a jeweler, and they had an attractive daughter who never married either. And you can see some of the traits that these Iranian Jews have in common with the Bukharians and how they uh, didn't want to marry for business, but they wanted wealth along with romance. And in this environment, uh, not to say that's incompatible, but it's much more difficult. But uh, the, f the head of the family was a leader in the Jewish leadership here at Israel, uh, Young Israel of Holliswood. So we've had a chance to see uh, Southern Russian Jews and Iranian Jews in this temple. The Bukharians have their own synagogue. They built a big one in Forest Hills, so they don't come here. But you have an opportunity to meet them in the school system. So that's the, the trend of what's happening in the Jewish community in Flushing. And again, I want to thank you for uh, listening, and I hope I gave you some information about what's going on in this area. Thank you.